I can't trust. Greatest heroes, people, celebrities, everybody was reading him and everybody was inspired by him and changed the vocabulary in Israel. But it came out that under the Nile River, dozens of, of women and men and boys and girls who were horrifically manipulated and exploited and abused. And it's so difficult for people, for good reason. We want to trust people. We want to trust role models. We want to trust authors, especially if your kids were inspired by a person. At such moments, you need vision, you need clarity. You have to understand that unfortunately, our society is a society with so much holiness and beauty. But inside, inside our closets, inside ourselves, there's a lot of trauma, there's a lot of pain, and there's often a lot of, lot of unresolved tension and evil. And when good things are happening, those things are going to come out precisely because good things are happening, precisely because there's a wave of inspiration and authenticity that it's going to spit out and suddenly you find out that one person sadly fell prey to such horrible internal instincts that they could not control. Or as the chief rabbi of Tzva said yesterday, that he spoke <coughs> to him and he told him, you maybe can't fix everything you have done, but you can do tshuva. You can apologize. You can become a role model of inspiration and talk about your mistakes. But he just denied everything. And in his words, Rabbi Shmuel Eliyahu, the chief rabbi of Tzvaz, he said he was more addicted to it than people are addicted to drugs. And there was nobody to talk to. It's the sadness that teaches us what exists in each and every one of us. It's really a reflection of how cautious a person has to be. I heard this from a big rav in Yerushalayim. He said there was once a Polish at Tzaddik. A Jew in Polish, they used to call them a Guteyid. You know, holy Jews, Tzaddikim. He had his community, his Hasidim, his disciples. And he was an old widower. He was 90 years old. His wife has passed away. So they had a bacher a yeshiva boy, who helped him. He tended to his needs. He lived with him in the house, and they were there together. There was also a Polish shiksa, a Polish non-Jewish woman who took care of the house. She cooked, she cleaned, she did the laundry. She was 75 years old. One night, the bacha tells the tzaddik, this Polish uh, rebbe, I have an errand to do for 20 minutes. Do you mind if I go? I'll come back. He says, yeah, gesund hate." The bacha leaves. Of course, it wasn't 20 minutes. It's like when your husband texts you, I'll be home in three minutes. It wasn't 20 minutes. He came home three hours later. It was a winter night. He approaches the house, and what does he see? This 90-year-old rebbe is standing outside of the house. He's shivering. He's 90 years old. He's cold. He's trembling. He's outside. He says, rebbe, why are you outside? He says, the cleaning lady is in the house. It's yichud. I'm not allowed to be in the house. He said, you didn't tell me you're going to leave the house. I would have come back right away. I would have not gone. He said, I didn't want to tell you. You also have a life. You also deserve to have a little vacation. You're also allowed to do something tonight. I didn't want to tell you. I wanted you to go. I didn't want you should feel imprisoned. But I couldn't stay in the house. So when you left, I also left. And I've been waiting here. It's fine. I'll be fine. The boy felt so bad. He felt so guilty. An El a 90-year-old man. It's late at night. It's cold. And he was also a great Jew. So now I tell you the story the way I heard it. He says, Rebbe, do you think Yichud applies to you? <laughs> and I'll use his words, you'll forgive me. He said, Ezeit Neinzik, und Ezeit Atzadik. Yeah? Sie ist 75 Jahre alt, Amiyase Shiksa. You're 90, you're righteous, you're holy. She's in a completely different spectrum. Do you really think that Yichud applies to you? You could have stayed home. He looked at this boy and he said, and I'll say it in Yiddish, Bacher, Bacher, Ich mit mein Yitzhahara in fünf Minuten wer ich jung und sie schön. With my Yitzhahara in five minutes. I become young, and she becomes gorgeous. This is how an Erlich Yid speaks. This is how an Erlich Yid thinks. 
This is a real person. This is a person who understands the weakness of people, his or her own weakness. Not because this person doesn't have elements that are glorious and heavenly, because that's the uniqueness of a person. Sula mutzav aitzav ereshim agiyah hashamayma. You're a ladder etched on the ground, but your head, your top reaches heaven. The human being is the interlacing link between heaven and earth, and therefore heaven lives in us, but earth lives in us. Paradise lives in us, and purgatory also lives in us. It's conscientiousness, it's awareness, it's Yerushamayim. Most importantly, inner work of introspection and honesty that allows a person not only not to fall prey, but to become giants of what it means to be a truthful person. But this is not bad news, it's good news. Because honesty sets us free. It's what clears up our systems, our brains, our collective and individual identity from lies, from falsehood. The ultimate truth of Hashem cannot dwell in a place of lies. It can't. And as long as we tolerate those lies, even though it's nice because nobody knows them, ultimately we're betraying everything. We're betraying reality. We're betraying our children. We're especially betraying the victims who lived with the secret of the Nile but couldn't talk about it because such a popular rabbi. So imagine that pain. So for a society to flourish, for a society to be real, we don't have to be afraid of exposing infections. It's like somebody telling the doctor, don't do the surgery, don't get rid of the infection, I don't like to see blood. Well, you know what? In six months you're going to die. Chas v'shalom. We have to expose it. If we don't expose it, what happens? Then innocent people suffer. Children suffer. Women suffer. Married people, single people. And nobody says a word. And nobody is even allowed to believe them. So not only are they murdered once, they're murdered twice when they come back and nobody believes them. Can't be, you're exaggerating. Real Jews have compassion for everybody. Even a perpetrator. Nobody understands the deep demons. But when I see that there's more compassion to a perpetrator than a victim, that drives me mad. The perpetrator has good PR. The victim never had PR for a day of their life. That's why they were victims. Where's the compassion to every victim that was emotionally murdered by a perpetrator? So when a society cannot talk about this in respectful but real terms, what does it mean? It means that we're destined to fall prey to this type of immorality again and again and again. TheYeshiva.net